Good morning. So Megan and I will be talking about the top 10 pitfalls of human rights um, and employment investigations in particular. As an overview, we're going to be talking about whether or not there is a duty to investigate and why there is that duty. The short answer is yes, it, there is a duty because it's law. Um, it, it's covered under um, the Human Rights Code as well as the Occupational Health and Safety Act. As an individual who's working in either the Human Resources Department of your company or senior management where um, Human Resources individuals would be coming to you with these types of uh, issues, you should know about this duty to investigate. As well as an, as an employee yourself, you should know what your uh, employer is required to do, what your rights are under these types of circumstances. So first of all, I'm going to go through um, the Human Rights Code. Uh, as a matter of general knowledge, everybody knows uh, pretty much about Section 5 of the Human Rights uh, Code. Um, subsection 1 talks about the right to equal treatment. Subse subsection 2 talks about the freedom from harassment. The factors are pretty much enumerated, can't be discriminated with respect to sex, gender, marital status, um, disability, etc. Uh, what's interesting about subsection 2 that it talks about freedom from harassment not only from your employer but also from an employer from an agent of the employer as well as by another employee so most companies while uh, unless they're small ones um, people at the top don't necessarily know what the individuals are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's particularly why uh, the duty to investigate becomes so important. Subsection 8, which um, not a lot of people know unless they come across these type of issues, is that there is no right to reprisal. So basically, if an employee comes to you with an issue, um, you as the employer should not be doing anything just for the fact that they are coming to you to try to enforce a right that they have. Uh, subsection 9 talks about, in general, that no person shall infringe or do anything directly or indirectly to infringe a person's right under the Human Rights Code. Now, the Moffitt and King Card case, uh, Kinnark's case, my apologies, um, was a 1999 case. Um, it was 1998, but the decision came out in 99. Uh, that's quite important and actually is cited by a lot of people. Um, the case kind of illustrates the significance of uh, the exposure that an employer can have with respect to um, the liability that could come up with a failure to, um, com to comply with the duty to investigate. So Moffitt, um, just for a matter of facts, he was um, a gay employee who was in a supervisory role and he had uh, he was a foster parent to a child. There were some rumors with respect um, to uh, his relationship with his foster child that came about in the workplace. Um, and he went to his uh, management saying that there's these rumors coming up and um, I feel like I'm a victim of these rumors and that um, the manager's not doing anything t about it and I feel like the workplace has become a poisoned work environment for me. Uh, no, they didn't do much about it and he ended up going to the tribunal to, to make a complaint, um, essentially. Because at the end of the day, he felt that they didn't do anything, they didn't investigate, um, he got dismissed with respect um, to discriminatory, discriminatory factors, um, and then he thought that there was some reprisal because there was a report that he thought was inaccurate that was uh, made to the Children's Aid Society. So at the end of the day, um, the tribunal basically found that uh, they upheld the allegations of discrimination um, and reprisal for failure to um, comply with the duty to investigate, but they found that they there was no uh, dismissal uh, with respect to discrimination. But that doesn't really end there because they gave him damages for discrimination and reprisal, but they also gave him a small portion, about $13,000, for loss of income. And normally when 
the tribunal says you didn't really terminate because of discrimination, you're not really supposed to get that loss of income. But the court, uh, the tribunal basically said that there was a continuing responsibility to investigate, and had the company uh, took in, taken steps to investigate and shown that they had tried to, you know, do something about this issue, then the employee would have had um, uh, would have had a, a better um, time transitioning into finding a new job. It took him about nine months to find a new job, so they gave him a little bit of money, even though the termination wasn't, they concluded that the termination wasn't because of discrimination. So the point of this case is that your, the employer could be somewhat still responsible if you don't take the steps to at least paper the fact that you've done everything you could to uh, comply with your duty to investigate. So the tribunal goes on to say that the whole point of, um, of the duty to investigate is to make that Section 5 of the Human Rights Code not a hollow protection. Uh, the duty is a means to an end, uh, and the end, of course, under the code is to provide a discrimination-free uh, environment for your employees. Um, now, next we're going to talk about the, sorry, the list. The Fkowski case, um, that was a 2005 case with respect to um, uh, a sexual um, harassment complaint. So Laskowska was um, a 16 year old who was working in marine land and she made a complaint with respect to uh, being inappropriately touched by the brother of the owner of marine land. Um, she made a complaint, um, you know, people came to her, her assistance, but then nothing was really resolved because um, it got turned over to the police. Uh, so she made a subsequent complaint to the Human Rights Tribunal saying that, um, you know, I didn't feel like Marineland did everything that they could uh, under my circumstances. So the tribunal basically said that there's three criteria uh, that they consider whether or not they've done the duty to investigate. The first is the awareness of the issues of um, discrimination and harassment. Um, was there awareness uh, that, that there could be an incident of discrimination and harassment at the time of the incident? Was there a suitable anti-discrimination harassment policy? Uh, was there a complaint mechanism in place where someone could actually uh, to come if there was a situation that happened. Um, and lastly, whether or not uh, there's adequate training. Because at the end of the day, if there's a policy but nobody's implementing it or nobody knows how to implement it, then the, the policy is pointless. Um, the next criteria they considered was post-complaint. Post um, once a complaint is made, did the employer actually treat it seriously? Uh, did they deal with the matter promptly um, and sensitively? Obviously, in this circumstance, it, it was a minor um, who had to come forward with a complaint. Uh, she had a sister that was older that assisted her. But um, given the situation, was the employer sensitive to the, the fact that it was a sexual harassment complaint? Um, and did they take uh, reasonable steps to investigate and then act upon their investigation? The last criteria was the resolution uh, of the complaint. Oh, sorry. The resolution of the complaint. Um, when after your investigation, um, did you make efforts to communicate those findings to the complainant? Um, did you get, provide the, the uh, employee with a healthy work environment that they could come back to if they so chose to? Um, and whether or not what you did and all the steps that you took were reasonable in general. Now, Megan's going to talk a little bit about the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So just when you were having enough fun doing your investigations under the Ontario Human Rights Code, um, in 2010, the Ontario government said, well, let's broaden the Occupational Health and Safety Act and add workplace harassment. And let's require employers to investigate when there is an issue of workplace harassment. So the Occupational Health and Safety Act was amended um, under Bill 168. It requires an employer now to have a workplace violence policy 
support the police harassment policy and to review these policies as often as necessary, but at least once a year. So I know most of you are sitting there going, hmm, when was the last time that thing was po posted and when was it reviewed? Good chance to go back when we change the date, 2014, and say that it's been reviewed again. The Occupational Health and Safety Act also required that an employer develop and maintain a program to implement its workplace harassment policy. What was required by that was that you essentially develop a program that will include measures and procedures for workers to report incidents of workplace harassment to an employer or to a supervisor, set out how the employer will investigate and deal with incidents and complaints of workplace harassment, and then if the Ministry of Labor wants to, they can add any prescribed elements. Today they have not, um, but they have the regulation power to require more of an employer to investigate workplace harassment. What is different from the code is um, that you do not need a prohibited ground to trigger the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So you don't need it to be race, sex, gender, uh, religion based to trigger workplace harassment. Any unwelcome conduct that the employee faces, they can bring a complaint forward and that will trigger an employer's duty to investigate. So for some of you, that means there's gonna be a lot more investigations, but as you'll hear us talk about, you do need to investigate in order to comply with your duties. Okay, so we're gonna start with the pitfalls. The first pitfall is failing to define the complaint. Um, and what we mean by that is when someone comes to you with an issue, um, you have to ask them what their concern is, who is involved, list the witnesses that could be identified, um, and make sure that uh, you understand what the complainant is coming to you. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to limit if they come to you with a discrimination um, with respect to a sexual harassment, but then later on you come out that someone else is uh, talking about religion. You, you don't have to confine your complaint um, to that, but make sure every time someone raises an issue, you define it and you address it with respect to the respondent so that they have an opportunity to understand what the issues are. Uh, the second pitfall is lack of thoroughness. Um, everybody understands that when someone comes to you with a problem, it's an uncomfortable situation and you want to rush through it. You want to make sure that this uncomfortable situation is dealt with and put to a side so that nobody has to feel like there's anything wrong anymore and that we're operating in a good and healthy environment. So the key for that is to be thorough with your evidence and to make sure that if someone comes to you with, the, with an issue, you actually um, ask all the questions, talk to the people that they say that they, you need to talk to, think about people outside of who um, they say you might need to talk to because obviously credibility is a big issue when it's a he said, she said situation and make sure that everybody, you get the, the full facts of the story without just hearing one side of it versus the other. Because as the employer, your um, job is basi uh, basically to know what happened and to try to address it. So as Flora and I are going through, is these are sort of our top 10 pitfalls that we come across. Um, one of them is undue influence. And what can occur with undue influence is that witnesses are either colluding together and they're speaking and then they go forward with a complaint that creates a problem where people have been sort of getting their story straight. Um, at the outset of an investigation, if you're the one conducting it, you should make sure that all witnesses are told that they should not be talking to each other about the events, um, that they should not be talking about the investigation and that there could be disciplinary action if they are found to, to be talking to one another. You also need to be careful when you are involving um, the union or legal representatives. Often employees do want to bring their lawyers along, um, especially an employee that might be facing dismissal. But they are not to dictate the evidence that the investigator, if that is you, hears. You need to decide how your investigation is going to be run and not let other people tell you how it's going to be run. Managers and directors, especially directors of companies, if it's involving a very serious sexual misconduct issue, may also want to get involved. Again, they need to stay away from the investigation so they don't taint it. They can't be influencing it because they're worried it's going to explode on the front page of the Toronto Star tomorrow. They need to take a step back and allow the investigator, if it's someone internal or even external, to be independent. 
in non-unionized workplaces, um, we often have a question come about of, can you bring a lawyer, um, especially a respondent that might be feeling they might, might face dismissal. Um, they want this right to remain silent. They've watched Law and Order at night, and they're like, well, I'm going to assert my right to remain silent. I'm not participating in this investigation. An investigation is a duty of the workplace parties. There is an obligation to participate. And um, while you can invite people to bring their lawyers, that lawyer needs to basically stay quiet. They can advise their client on their legal rights, but the employee needs to answer the questions of the investigator. Um, our Supreme Court of Canada has said that it is fair for an employer to exclude the lawyer if they want. So if you do feel that a lawyer is interfering, they can be excluded. Sometimes a lawyer can be helpful because they can help the person communicate their story, but if they're going to interfere, they can be asked to leave. In unionized workplaces, it's a little bit different because you're actually looking to a collective agreement to see what rights that person has, whether or not during an investigation meeting, if the person has a right to have a union representative present. And so you need to look to the collective agreement in a unionized workplace. Um, again, anyone who is interfering with the investigation needs to be warned, and if they are continuing to interfere, they need to be excluded. One of the cases where we saw some of this undue influence come about was CR and Schneider National Carriers. Um, CR was a female supervisor, and she sued for wrongful dismissal after she was terminated. She supposedly was using profane language in the workplace. She displayed herself in various stages of nudity, which is like Marty earlier, I'll leave that one to your imaginations as to how far those stages went. And she invited trainees into a submissive relationship. Again, I'll leave that one to your imagination. Um, we have no picture of that. CR successful, successfully sued um, Schneider. The court found that the complainants had compared notes before they lodged their complaints, and witnesses were interviewed in front of each other. So very important that witnesses need to be interviewed separately. There needs to be no colluding of the stories. The fourth pitfall that we often come about, and what this comic, which I don't know if this clear, says that we've investigated ourselves and found no evidence of wrongdoing. Certainly if I investigate myself, I find no evidence of wrongdoing. Um, that leads us into an issue of bias, and that often comes up in the court challenging the investigation for having a certain bias. You need, very, need to be very careful if you are the investigator, especially if you're internal in HR, that you're not trying to favor the employer, which is hard because they're paying your paycheck, but you need to be independent. You need to have no bias towards certain members of management. Um, sometimes what happens is we get the chronic complainer that comes forward, and we kind of sit there going, wow, like I want to dismiss this right away. This person's in my office five times a week. Um, again, you need to take their complaint seriously, and you can't just dismiss them because they appear to be a chronic complainer. Um, there are tendencies sometimes for investigators to favor people who are like them, especially other members of management, because you have to work with each other. Again, you've got to be aware of that bias. Um, there's always the tendency to favor the easiest decision. Again, you don't want to end up in front of a court or in front of the Human Rights Tribunal and say you didn't do a thorough job, you rushed to judgment. So you have to be aware to not rush to the easiest decision. And also be careful about being swayed by members of management. Very hard if the COO or the CEO comes into your office and says, as that investigation going, I'd like you to wrap it up because it's getting a little bit uh, dicey out there. Again, you have to be able to do your investigation fairly and take the time to be as thorough as possible um, to get to an outcome. This came about um, recently, the issue of bias in Elgert and home hardware stores. Um, often retailers, for some reason, tend to get called out on their investigations. I don't know why that is. The court upheld a wrongful dismissal against Home Hardware that had fired a 17-year supervisor for sexual harassment. Um, the court found that the investigation had been biased. They awarded 24 months for a 17-year supervisor in lieu of notice, as, as pay in lieu of notice as damages, and 75,000 in punitive damages. Punitive, punitive damages are very rare from a court, and so when they are awarding them, that is really to punish the employer for conduct that the court doesn't approve of. The court cited that there was numerous problems with the investigation, including that the investigator had no previous experience with investigations. 
The investigator was a friend of the complainant's father. The investigator had already made up his mind um, as to the employee's guilt before speaking to him. And the investigator only interviewed one of the complainants and then hearsay. Oh, that's a good ring. Um, and hearsay witnesses that had no direct knowledge of the facts. So what does that um, leave us with in terms of what you should do to avoid that sort of bias? Train your employees. There are a lot of training programs. We can also offer training programs on how to do a proper investigation. Um, if you have people internally that are going to do it, again, you want to invest in the training so that you're not called in front of a court and the first question will be, you know, how much training have you had on investigations and you say none. Um, you want to ensure that there is some sort of training. If you are using internal investigators, ensure that they do have autonomy. Um, so best not to be reporting to the person that you are investigating. You want to have some sort of independence so there's no active influence. External investigators, you want to make sure that they have no conflict of interest, that they haven't had some sort of business, previous business relationship with you, and that they don't um, fall to any undue influence from the company. What I've often had as questions is, should you always go to an external investigator? That is extremely expensive, especially given requirements under the Occupational Health and Safety Act to investigate any sort of unwelcome conduct uh, that an employee faces. But sometimes you do need them, especially when you're dealing with very senior management or a serious situation that could explode and have a lot of liability, like sexual misconduct or racial profiling, you may want to involve an external investigator and invest the money to make sure that your investigation is going to be done at arm's length and thoroughly. Um, often we do see people uh, hiring lawyers to do those investigations. We are trained to hopefully find facts and, and do a good job at doing that. But what's also important about when you look at hiring a lawyer is that there are duties under the rules of professional conduct for lawyers. So lawyers have to maintain the integrity of the profession and that means they have to be trustworthy and have the public's confidence in the profession. Despite what some lawyers jokes might say, we do have this duty. And um, that is one of the reasons for looking at hiring a lawyer. Other reasons is that lawyers do have a, a duty to act in good faith to all persons. And so they really are to treat all the parties in a workplace investigation equally and not be favoring one over the other. And again, they have, uh, lawyers have a duty to avoid conflicts of interest when we're hired to do matters whether or not we're representing an employer or doing an investigation. Also what's important is that lawyers are under a special duty, um, special responsibility special responsibility to respect human rights laws in all of our professional dealings. And so lawyers um, do have these added responsibilities that sometimes lends, lends themselves to being external investigators and being able to come in and investigate very sensitive issues in the workplace. And then I'll hand it over to Flora for pitfall number five. <laughs> so the fifth pitfall is not doing an investigation, period. Um, We've been talking about how to do a proper investigation, but sometimes uh, employers just don't even bother investigating because of perhaps some of the biases that Megan had um, mentioned before. Uh, like sometimes you think, oh, maybe it's just a rumor, or if it's a chronic complainer who comes to you with every little bit of thing, um, uh, or if it's someone who just doesn't really want to talk about it, but you've heard it through uh, down the pipes that, um, or up the pipes, I guess, uh, that there may be an issue. And most often, uh, if there is no investigation, the explanation that the employer says is because, oh, well, I just thought it wasn't a big deal. Um, the problem and the truth of the matter is that it is a big deal because um, it's impacting one of your employees. Uh, and if later on they decide to make it an issue and you've done nothing about it, that's something that the employer exposes them to uh, themselves to because they haven't done anything uh, because they thought it was minor. Uh, the next pitfall is um, failing to communicate the status of the investigation. Uh, we understand that you know it, an investigation is just a part of your ongoing business. There's other things going on uh, in the day-to-day -day operations, uh, but to the complainant, that is a big part of their life. So as the employer and you're investigating, if there are things that delay the investigation, you should be updating the complainant. Um, if 
you know, the, either you, the investigator, or some of the witnesses that you need to talk to if they're not away, um, or if they are away, and you need uh, some additional time to make sure that you conduct a proper investigation. The easiest thing to do is to explain it to the complainant or um, someone who is acting um, for the complainant as their agent so that they understand. The, Ontario Human Rights Commission says that you should aim for approximately 90 days, which is about three months, to uh, have some sort of uh, report or conclusion. But of course, if it takes longer, the, seat, uh, the circumstances um, are, also, are always whether or not it's reasonable um, and whether or not delays can be explained. You can't just put it aside, but you can't take forever and, and not explain to the complainant what's going on because that's the first issue when uh, they feel that uh, their their uh, problem isn't being addressed properly. One of the other pitfalls is the failure to consider all relevant evidence, and it sort of goes along with the other pitfalls of failing to be thorough. Is um, you know you have relevant witnesses, as we saw in the earlier case, that um, are not interviewed, and you're interviewing you know all these character or hearsay witnesses, but you don't actually get to people that might have knowledge of of the facts, you need to make sure that you are interviewing all witnesses. Um, one of the best ways to, to gather the witnesses is to ask both the complainant and the respondent to make a list of who they consider potential witnesses, but don't feel bound by that as the investigator. You need to look at the investigation, look at the complaint, determine who, will, who do you need to talk to to have a, a full understanding of what has happened. Um, review all the, the relevant documents. Remember we are in the electronic age. So just because someone has handed you a pile of paper and said, here's the relevant documents, we need to be aware that we have text messages going on. And a lot of harassment and bullying we're finding is by text messages, sometimes on home computers, um, we're finding on Facebook. And so we have to be alive to the fact that the harassment might be going on somewhere else in electronic form, and you may need to gain some sort of access to that. The best way to ensure, as an investigator or human resources, that you get access is you need to have your privacy policy and your electronic use policy to an ensure, ensure that you can gain access when you are doing an investigation to the employee's email or that you're asking the employee um, to produce certain things off of their personal emails in order to conduct a workplace investigation. And so the best way to do that is to make sure that you have employees sign off on your privacy and your electronic use policy. The other pitfall, and this often comes about when uh, the respondent who's been accused of some sort of sexual harassment or, or some uh, sexual misconduct, is that they were not given the opportunity to provide a full response. That is often what we hear when they are suing for wrongful dismissal. You do need to give the respondent, um, even if you think the facts are absolutely clear, you need to give them an opportunity to fully respond. You need to hear their side of the story. So what does that mean in terms of how far do you have to go? Because often the complainant will say, I don't want them to know I made the complaint. I don't want you to release my, my name to them. The courts have generally held that the respondent does have the right to the names of the people that are accusing them of some sort of wrongdoing so that they can provide a full response. There are some cases that are coming out though from the courts that said, okay, if there's gonna be a danger to the complainant, or to the complainants involved. If they're gonna be at risk of further retaliation or bullying, maybe in those circumstances, employer, you can hold back the names as long as the, the respondent gets enough facts that you feel that they can adequately respond. So generally, the complainant's name is gonna to have to go forward. You might be able to hold back if you think that there's gonna be a further retaliation against the complainant. Copy of the complaint, again, the courts have sort of said, well, you know, think you should hand over the complaint so they can fully respond. But if you can give the respondent at least a bullet points or some thorough description of what the complaint is about, that's enough for them to respond, that will satisfy that, that duty to be able to give them to fully respond rather than actually handing over the written complaint itself. So the second last pitfall is uh, documenting the, in the, the investigation. As lawyers, we always tell you paper, paper, paper. Make sure everything is in writing. Make sure you have witness statements and you don't just hear it verbally and go off the top of your head later on what someone said. 
make sure you've uh, made copies of everything that you've reviewed um, and that there's an investigation report with your results. And the purpose of this is that, as you can see from some of the cases, the investigation is the first step. But if it turns into a bigger issue, like a tribunal or a court action, then you need to know that you've papered everything throughout the course of your